Thank you so much. Um, we've heard so far um, different forms of conflicts in the Middle East, uh, whether we're talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Syria, the Kurdish issue. Um, we really need to be clear about something. We need to, if we're looking at deconstructing the security architecture um, of the EU towards the Middle East, uh, we need to be clear about some of the misconceptions and problems there. And um, in my talk, I'm going to focus on three issues, three problematic issues of such policies. First, they are contradictory. Second, they're short-sighted. And third, they are based on a lot of misconceptions. So when I say contradictory, where uh, we see a lot of efforts and policies that are being forced to support refugees and help the people who are um, uh, misplaced and uh, because of the different conflicts in the region, we need to be clear about a very I mean, basic concept. No conflict is sustained without resources. And when you talk about resources, we're not just talking about financial resources or human, human resources, but I mean, the main base of any conflict is the supply of arms. But just to give you a few uh, figures to show you how contradictory the policies of the EU towards the Middle East, which on one hand is trying to maintain security and stop the conflicts, but on the other hand, it's fueling it. So for example, since 2014, Germany have approved arms sales worth of 25 billion euros. Just in the third quarter of 27, uh, 2017, the German government again approved 450 million euros just to Saudi Arabia and Egypt. That's five times the same period in 2016. And this is not just Germany. Uh, there are eight countries in Europe who have approved $1.2 billion of arms to Saudi Arabia, Jordan, UAE, and Turkey. And considering a lot of sources of different surveys and, uh, and research reports, uh, was like this, this past five period is considered the highest since the Cold War. Uh, and I mean, the problem is if, if you look at countries like Saudi Arabia, the, like with this five years, uh, the increase was 212% of increase in the arms imports. And for Qatar, for example, it was 245. So there might be an argument saying that this is important because we are fighting terrorism and there's a need to have this kind of supply of arms. But the problem is, I mean, there's no guarantee where those arms are, um, I mean, the, the falls into the hands of others than those who are fighting terrorism and actually falls in the hands of those who are, I mean, uh, creating this form of, of terrorism. Uh, and the other problem is that governments keep on maintaining this view of the physical world, that the old approaches to uh, so security and maintaining security over borders, whereas right now reports are showing the ease and the facility that is out there to have any illicit arm transaction. Just in 2014 to 2015, there was 1,300 illicit arms transactions just over social media. And with some of those who were interviewed on such research, they would say it only take a couple of phone calls or a DM on Twitter just to get anything between a nine millimeter and a rifle. And those, I mean, like the, the making, I mean, like, or the brands of these, is like 60% of those rifles are Kalashnikov, 14% are Belgian made. So you see, I mean, on one hand, there are all those efforts to support refugees and have all those summits and conferences to uh, work on this. There are also contradictory uh, policies out there. So this is the first issue. The second issue we're talking about is the idea of the misconceptions that are out there. 
the, the fight of terrorism and the focus on security, when we talk about fighting particular groups, there is a focus that these groups or misassumption or misconception that these groups are static and localized. So looking at the immediate issue, and just I'm going to uh, finish very soon, is like thinking that these groups are static. Whereas in reality, I mean, those fighters move between one group and the other. So if you focus on ISIS, on maybe like in a particular time, I mean, there's no guarantee that this is actually the main issues because after that, those fighters would flee to other forms of, or, or places of conflict. And they would just like move around. And the, the third part of the issue with uh, such policies or the security architectures, uh, architecture of the EU towards the Middle East is actually is short-sighted. And short-sighted is that no one is looking at the day after. It's like, it's great that you fight and win the war in Mosul and Raqqa and fight ISIS, but then no one is thinking and planning seriously about the the power vacuum that is out there. There is no governance and these are the blind spots. And this is where terrorism flourish. So these are the three problems really about the security architecture in Europe right now. And if we are serious about attacking those, we really need to look at those problems and deconstruct and reconstruct our view of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we have time for one or two questions, so if the audience, or if people want to ask from the panel questions. No questions. I'm really surprised that there are no questions. I think this is the most complicated agenda that I've ever run into if you add up all these problems that have just been evoked and those which exist in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean, we should have plenty of questions. Um, but let me make one comment which goes in the line of when everybody is pessimist, be an optimist and vice versa. Um, uh, Dr. Schott, I think, I generally believe you've been an old timer in all these uh, peace negotiations I really believe that if the Americans in the next few weeks do put on the table a plan, a concept, it should not be rejected. Um, the parties may have reservations. I suspect the Palestinians may have more than the Israelis. Still, it's there. But who knows? May, we may be pleasantly surprised if we do go into the process and if we use some lessons learned, I do have a certain feeling that odds are good that we will make progress. So let's do that. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, it's always worthwhile to try something, but we tried the Americans for 26 years. Um, really, I mean, the whole peace process was chaperoned by the Americans, run by the Americans, managed by the Americans, pressured by the Americans, and here we are. What a horrid failure of American peacemaking that is the result today is where it, where it is. I mean, the Palestinian people today, I mean, there's still refugees all over the world. Their land is being taken piece by piece. Settlers today uh, are 30% of the population of the West Bank, and the, and the Americans are still there, watching, supporting, um, doing nothing. What do you expect from Mr. Trump? I mean, with all respect, I mean, we already have seen his activities in many other conflict areas, and I have not seen anything that will really break the... Uh, the, the tradition of American policy and comes out with something new. I'd rather wait to see a, a world that is multipolar, a world that bases itself on international law, a world that can implement agreements it supervises. Uh, this has not really happened by the Americans, and I don't think Mr. Trump is much of a change. 
All right, but still it's worth uh, once they put some proposal on the table to see whether, I mean, Nikki Haley, the, 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 the US ambassador in the United Nations seemed to suggest that they're about to bring forth a plan. Let's, let's at least be open-minded about examining it. Then. Let us see. I just wanted to add that um, I was looking at recent polling data on Palestinians and the problem is increasingly the younger generation of Palestinians are divorcing themselves from the whole idea of any kind of negotiated settlement. It is partly to do with the lack of credibility of the US and, and others, but it's, it's also that they are coming round to the idea that boycotting and the whole BDS movement for them at least has a way of retaining and getting back their dignity, even in situations where they're constantly being humiliated. Now you could say as an end goal, this is not very constructive, it's, it's sulking, but there is a strategy behind it, which is more people now are in favor of a binational state. In other words, by default, drifting into something which you know is not favorable particularly for Palestinian statehood, but it's not good for Israel either because it would water down the Jewish character of the Israeli state. And I was in Tel Aviv recently for the INSS conference and it was very interesting to see how few Israelis were talking about the Palestinians as a problem at all, but how many of them were talking about what the future of an Israeli state's going to look like if they drift into what they see as being a nightmare choice between being a Jewish state or a democratic state because you know no one sees this binational eventuality being something which treats Palestinians within it in the same way that the Jewish population of Israel is treated so you would have a, a two-tier citizenship and I think these issues are taking us away from any belief in you know, let's have, everyone knows what the maps look like, the 67 lines, there is no question that actually trading land for peace is the way to do it. What I worry about, and you perhaps could comment on this, is that the wider Palestinian public, who used to be in favor of a two-state solution, is now, I think it's 36% uh, now support two states, as opposed to 50% who supported it a year ago. There's still a majority of Israelis support a two-state solution, but they never seem to vote for the kind of coalitions and governments that actually are going to implement that. Or to implement when the, the Prime Minister Netanyahu, whether he stays or goes, says two states, he's actually really thinking of what has been described by Daniel Levy and others as Bantu Stan, something that isn't really a Palestinian viable state with sort of access and uh, the means to survive except as second-class citizens. So I think we've gone beyond negotiations because of that. Right, but now we really need to conclude, so thank you very much. <laughs> About very interesting time.